I have to thank Zoom and everyone who, if there are technical problems, for having illustrated what we're going to be talking about today. And it's really to think that um, with kind of unprecedented events, we are now prototyping the future probably in a more accelerated way than the slow motion we've seen in the past. And so the first part of the, of the discussion and the exchange we want is to really look at um, a number of existing trends which will accelerate. We will then also look at a number of trends which are decelerating or new ones which are emerging. And we'll want to wrap up before the Q&A to try and understand what world should we aspire for? It's one thing to observe certain trends, but I think that beyond the trends themselves, there's what we aspire to and the agency we have for that. The first trend, which I think is, uh, is important, and this is not a new concept, it's really um, exponential. It's the degree of acceleration we're seeing in the concept of exponential. And the fact that through COVID, it's becoming that more, much more tangible. And so I want to just illustrate what we mean by exponential. If you look at the middle picture, there's a lovely painting by Monet, um, the Giverny lilies. And if you take that um, pond of lilies and you say that the lilies are doubling every day, and you're considering that it's a 30 day month and that on the 30th day, the pond of lilies will be 100% full. And if the question is what percentage of fullness is the pond on day 28, it's only 25%. And then the 29th day is 50% and the 30th of day is 100%. Now, unfortunately, humans are not cabled to process. We have a cognitive bias. We think more linearly. But what that means is that when something grows exponentially and as an example, when it doubles every day, what you have is that for 27 of the days, you actually have less than 20% of the pond, which is full. And I know that when you do the maths and when you say it like that, it might seem trivial and obvious, but it isn't. With COVID, we have seen that we are not good at processing exponential. But the important thing is that it means that you really need to prepare for what might happen. You can't predict or extrapolate because things can happen gradually and then suddenly. But it's also a very positive thing. It's positive because you can benefit in terms of scaling with network effects or platforms versus relying on linear growth. It's beneficial because you can accelerate your learning and your thinking. So this is the one concept I wanted to talk about. If you see it through technology, this is a key area because as technologies converge, basically you end up with an acceleration even further of exponential. And you're seeing that because you're having cheaper, faster, smaller computing power. And so all of the emerging technologies are converging and therefore um, feeding each other. There's a well-known law, which is Amara's law. And Amara's law states that we tend to overestimate the impact of a technology in the short run, but underestimate the effect in the long run. So humanity gradually then suddenly can get wrong footed by these exponential game changers. And this is an extremely important point because while technology is not the only factor around exponential, we saw it with COVID, um, it's a very big driver to some of the things we'll be observing. Now, I talk about the future, of course, as uh, Alvin Toffler mentions, um, futurists are not in the game of prediction. And so I'm not trying to, to predict anything, but it is important to decode certain signals to try and process and understand the next order implications. And in doing so, the next topic, which I think is accelerating, is the future is free. And this future is free is basically, so the echo started again. I don't know if everybody can go on mute. It suddenly just started again. Okay, it's gone. Um, so the future is free is a, is a two-way street where basically it seems good because free can be good. And it's free because basically there's a marginal, there's zero marginal cost when something is digitized. It's demonetized, it's dematerialized, and it's democratized. And that has virtue. It's democratized in the sense that whether you're a Stanford professor with access to some of the best minds in the world, 
or whether you're on a sort of $40 smartphone in a remote part of India with 5G, you can pretty much, you know, get the same information. And so this, this has a virtue and it has a democratization effect, which has an important um, social lever we can, we can play with. But, and this is what Anderson, the famous VC, coined software is eating the world. When you look at the next order implications, the next order impacts of, of that, you're, you're seeing that software is eating software. And you're entering an environment where you have a more and more of a tendency towards no code or low code. So you take your website, which you build on Wix, on Squarespace, you take WhatsApp. All these are really seeing that software is eating software. And you're seeing the importance of, of data, of course, but also if everything is free, how do you get paid? What do you get paid for? And so the question we need to ask ourselves, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is really around data and it's around augmentation versus substitution and, and what that means. I'm, I'm going to spend a moment on, on data itself because we all know certain features of data. We know that there's a privacy issue. We know that it can be replicated easily for the better, for the worse. We may or may not know that more and more humans are merging with data, what I call biodigital, and there's a hacking consideration around that. Yuval Harari talks a lot about this feature. And we know that the bias and the ethical considerations, the understanding between correlation and causation, but I think the important thing about data is really to understand that because of how important data is, the future is far from free. Related to data, you need to really develop the fluency of understanding that language, understanding the costs and the nuances of that language. Understand that the data is information, that that's knowledge, that that's insight. What that means and what control we have over, have over it. And my hope actually is that in the same way as we teach languages at school, or as, as, um, as many of you pointed out to me, maybe we don't teach languages enough, but there is one language which should be taught equally as to English or whatever language once taught as a primary language at school, which is that of data. There's a trend which I'm finding partially fascinating and, and with interest and partially um, more intriguing and of concern, which is science fiction accelerating to science fact. And don't get me wrong, again, if you look at how many science fiction themes and topics have become reality over time, this is nothing new. It started from Jules Verne, it continues over time. In the 1930s, people first did the schematic look at what a credit card could look like. If you take a minority report, they probably 100 painted inventions from virtual reality to driverless cars, which are now becoming reality. So this is not a new theme. I do sense, though, when you look at the venture capital investments, when you look at some of the themes, some of the transactions that some of the companies are doing, that this is an acceleration in terms of the fine line between science fiction and science fact. Facebook did a very interesting acquisition um, a year or so ago um, called Control Labs, which is a neural interface. And this neural interface, it's, it's you know, they paid maybe 500 to, to a billion dollars for it. But basically, although it's done initially with electrical impulses and not necessarily the brain today, it really shows you how a group like Facebook is thinking about the journey towards brain computer interface. It so happens that Facebook also have a joint venture with um, Ray-Ban, which is a subsidiary of Luxottica, one of the largest glass and glasses manufacturers in the world. And so they have Project Oreo, which is to take smart glasses which can take calls and interact in the augmented reality um, dimension. And they're dematerializing the sensors, the controllers and the smartphone. So you don't even need the smartphone or battery to tether. So you can see where this is going. You, you can basically, you don't need a smartphone or an iPhone. You're gonna have a pair of glasses, which is augmented reality, and you can speak directly to that pair of glasses. But the next extension to that, of course, is that you won't need the glasses themselves you'll be able to directly have brain computer interface and black mirrors suddenly doesn't seem as much as a, as a sort of a theoretical or, or, um, or fiction. There's an interesting investment um, by a company called Haptics, which uh, got funding for gloves with an array of pneumatic actuators, which were inflating when you touch, which inflate. So those actuators inflate and give you a virtual reality environment. 
So what that is, is that it's the first haptic telerobotic system to transmit touch feedback to an operator anywhere in the world. So that's kind of remote touch in a sense. Or Mojo Vision, which got 100 million funding so far, which has announced the first augmented reality compact lens. So that, that really brings us to think about, and, and you know, Professor Misho Kaku, who's a very um, well-renowned theoretical physicist, who's a very respected um, uh, futurist and a professor at uh, City College of New York and, and CUNY Graduate Center, he basically said, you know, once confined to fantasy and science fiction, time travel is now simply an engineering problem. And I know some of you might, might sort of be a little bit in disbelief or wonder what we mean by that. And it's due to a number of things. It's due to the convergence and maybe the fusion and digital synergies between artificial intelligence, 5G, Internet of Things, sensors, virtual reality, and mixed reality. It's due to the fact that with what's the developments in, in VR, which are not yet, you know, um, they're just on the way, they're not yet there, but you're moving more and more towards immersive reality. And with cybernetics and brain-computer interface, you have the combination as well as materials breakthrough with holographic technology, materials breakthrough in terms of nano manufacturing, nano engineering. So with technology and wearables, once you can see, once you can hear, once you can feel, and you have human machine interface, is it that absurd to think about di digital teleportation or space travel or time travel? It's what I call DEIP, DEP, Delocalized, Experiential, Immersive, and Personalized. So that's a theme which I'm, I'm watching closely, as are many others, and I'm not actually a science fiction geek, but I couldn't stop realizing how important this is becoming um, as, a, as a theme, which is, which is clearly accelerating. Now, one area I want to spend a minute on is China. And forgive me for the pronunciation, I, I don't pronounce it in, in the way our, our leader does here, I just say China. But there's an accelerated trajectory, I think, of China, and maybe in a way the unintended consequences of, of what is happening with some of the trade war and some of the, the restrictions um, that the US and others are imposing in China. What it means is that China won't basically move in a very accelerated way to becoming independent. So this has implications because it's clearly commendable that Amazon and Microsoft and IBM are rethinking and pausing AI facial recognition given the potential use for law enforcement and abuses. But it does bring the debate around national AI competitiveness globally because China is certainly not pausing. And China is certainly not as restricted in terms of um, their safeguards, let's, let's put it that way. And they are basically have 1.4, 1.5 billion people for which they can train the data and the algorithms on. So the trade restrictions around these sensitive areas is also accelerating China's um, position in chip manufacturing, semiconductors. And we all know, or many of you may know that uh, chips, especially with AI edge chips, of, for the 21st century, what, you know, it's like controlling oil in the 20th century. And these are proprietary deep learning artificial intelligence processes. And a lot of the breakthroughs in AI are increasingly through the hard way. That's why Google and Facebook are taking in-house what used to be outsourced in terms of their own hardware. So the heart of deep learning systems for images, for language recognition, is through these AI chips. And China will be independent on this technology and supply chains because it's forced to do so. In a way, it was always going towards that. But I would say that the, there's been an acceleration and maybe an unintended consequences of the, the trade war. In quantum computing, of course, there have been further major breaks and breakthroughs on China. Some announced you know, as early as uh, last week with uh, uncrackable quantum communication space, which is a new breakthrough. Um, and... And so you look at the, the players in China, like Alibaba, Tencent, and Huawei, who are focused on artificial intelligence and quantum computing, initially for, for most of them came from the consumer side, but with a sample of a billion people, they basically are gonna make breakthroughs, which maybe the rest of the Western world cannot do. So that will accelerate the dominance of China. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting we should follow China's approach. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't acknowledge 
the importance um, and the necessity for, for all the key areas around privacy, around surveillance, and I'm very sensitive to all that. At the same time, what I am saying is that we got to realize what that means. It means that China will go on a fast track in the same way as GDPR in Europe is a, is a fantastic thing to do and, and protect the citizens and data privacy, but it does have implications. There's been a slowdown in AI investments in Europe and some of the breakthrough and investments have not necessarily been um, European led as of late on, on AI. And some consider that GDPR is a contributing factor to that. So the last theme I want to touch upon in terms of some of the accelerating trends is, is around what I call radical transparency and traceability. This is increasing. This is a great thing. Um, we're seeing a, the start of a decline of shareholder primacy. We're maximizing shareholder returns is the, is the kind of only and prime objective. And this is also ver the very important themes around social, around um, the clean supply chain transparency, around um, social equality. Um, and I feel that there's still a lot of progress to go, but there's an acceleration on this theme. There's still a lot of progress simply because we call it shareholder or stakeholder capitalism, but ultimately the measures through technology are great because it forces um, transparency on the ESG metrics, it forces clean supply chain transparency, and I think technology is actually very helpful to, to force the accountability and the traceability of what's being said so that companies don't just basically pay lip service through green and social washing. However, insofar as you store reward shareholders and companies from metrics in terms of shareholder maximization, you kind of have a little bit of a disconnect between uh, you know, really moving from shareholder primacy to stakeholder capitalism. But that's accelerating that trend, and I think um, there'll be changes around that that uh, governments and regulators will, will enforce. So, so let's spend a minute now on um, a few trends which are, which are decelerating. And these decelerating trends Again, it's not that they're disappearing, it's not that they weren't there before, but I feel that um, <clears> the <throat> recent events in a prolonged way will have an impact on these. The first one is what I call earthly. So earthly is, it's an odd term, I'm not sure I'm, it's the right term, but I'm trying to describe the unbundling of earth, the unbundling of global connectivity. Things becoming less tangible, less earthly, more virtual. Whether it's Earth and the exploration of space, a lot of you saw the recent launch of SpaceX, but this is not just a specific launch or, or specific individuals trying to have fun. It's a very determined program for space exploration towards Mars and which is going to see tens of billions and ultimately hundreds of billions towards um, moving away from just the reliance on Earth. We're seeing between the world and the virtual world, what is, what is real in real life, in game, digital twins, second life, artificial reality. We're seeing the globalization move towards maybe planetization or possibly regionalization. So it's become a tricky, very different environment um, from, what, from what we've seen in the past. And it affects the supply chains, of course, with local, local supply chain reliance and maybe even the un, unchained, supply unchained. Um, through the, the transparency we talked about earlier. So that leads, you know, the question around United Nations or un-United Nations. It brings the question of certain countries and the influence like China, which we talked about, or even the whole economy, economy and industrial systems, banks and financial systems versus new virtual digital asset classes. Um, Fortnite is, is great, for instance. It's a marketplace. Money can go in, but can't go out. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting, right? The second decelerating trend is around, <clears throat> around what, I, what I call in the end of linear. To a degree, one could consider that it's the other side of the coin of exponential. But I think it's, it is more to it than that. It means that basically the element of predictability the ability to extrapolate is, is less effective, to say the least. So what you're seeing is that what you had previously as the three-phase life, you know, you work, your education, sorry, you go to work, you retire, 
how does that work in a hundred year life or even when you're modifying aging and, and it's not just a hundred year life that's the norm, but maybe beyond that. What does it mean in terms of specialization where you're learning to do specific things versus T-shaped, maybe less specialized? There's a wonderful book I, I really strongly recommend on that topic by David Epstein, which is called Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a, in a Specialized World. And it really touches upon that theme. You're looking at planned versus emergence. It's interesting what happened to us at 9 a.m. my time with the Zoom call. We had planned a bunch of things, but things emerge. And that adds actually the fluidity we have to get used to, I think. Beyond the specific COVID and the Zoom call, I actually think that that's a fundamental element we should be living every day and learning to, to adapt with, anticipate. We're looking at the world where everything is permissioned, where it's a hierarchy, where you have control mechanisms to per permissionless, self-organized networks where good, great companies and governments have professionally produced marketing and propaganda to use generated for the better and for the worst with the manipulation. So the last one I'm going to touch upon is, um, is really a little bit of a tricky one, and I want to try and approach it in a way that's uh, um, not too binary or, or, or necessarily as negative as it might sound. But... I think that there's a deceleration of what one might label and call industries, sectors, and professions. And just to be clear, I'm talking about the way they are currently defined and the way they are currently um, experienced by different companies and by individuals. It's not necessarily to say that if jobs disappear that exist today or if industries reshape, that it doesn't mean there aren't opportunities, but it just means that they'll be different from what we understand and what exists today. Anything that can be automated, anything that can be disintermediated will be. So you're gonna have distinct industries, sectors, professions, as we've always known them, which are gonna be radically transformed. Again, coming back to exponential, this is where it's extremely important to understand what ex exponential means because it's not always discernible day to day. Exponential technology takes shape in slow motion. It's gradually and then suddenly. And that's why we need to understand what's happening because it's like the 27 first days of the pond and the lily. It's like January and February in the Western world with COVID. It doesn't mean it's not having that exponential trend. It's just in slow motion. But when it hits, it hits for real and reaches 100%. So you look at the automotive industry, it's very interesting. NVIDIA yesterday, which is a chip manufacturer, many of you use those chips for, for gaming, but also artificial intelligence, basically um, announced an agreement with Mercedes-Benz to consider that NVIDIA chip manufacturer, manufacturer, which as we discussed earlier, semis are pretty important now, they will basically have the entire operating system they will have the platform for Mercedes-Benz. Basically, Mercedes-Benz will be doing the shape and the branding and anything that's intelligent, anything that's a platform, anything that's a system is gonna be run by, um, driven by NVIDIA's technology. In the same way as there was um, an announcement, I think it was Volkswagen last week, which basically said tomorrow there will be um, a few operating systems and even few automotive players. So you're seeing that you need to look beyond automation. You need to see what industries become. You need to think about that transformation. If you take professional um, jobs, if you take different professions, you need not to think about, okay, how is that going to be automated? But how might the same outcomes be achieved when they're performed by capable intelligent systems? And what does that mean in terms of new professional skills, which will be required, which are not identifiable today? So once again, it's not necessarily saying that there'll be no jobs, but rather that we need to process the next order implications of what is happening to make sure that, you know, we have the right skills for that. So I'm now going to talk about some trends which I see as emerging. And I'm going to start with liminality. And on liminality, this is a little bit 
what we experienced earlier, except that, and what we're experiencing with COVID, liminality means a state, a stage, a period of transition. It's an in-between where the only constant we have is, is kind of ambiguous. It's a big blur. Everything blurs, lines are less defined, they're fluid and evolving. What has been is no more, and what will be is not yet. Now, that is nothing new in terms of there being in between. What I think is new is that you can't just wait to get to the other side. We have to embrace this liminality because what I think is happening is that we won't have as much of a binary world, even in five years, 10 years, or 15 years. And therefore, the lines between what's human or genetic engineering or artificial intelligence, what's normal, new normal. You're not gonna have, you know, you suddenly walk out and the next morning it's the new normal or in real life versus artificial reality, or natural versus artificial, real, fake, authentic, synthetic. You see where this is going. We talked about science fact, what's physical, what's digital, what's a competitor, what's a partner, what's meat, what's clean meat, what you learn or unlearn or relearn. So that is where we need to, to really learn to embrace it. And, and actually, liminality is, is a wonderful concept. It um, has its origins in Zen Buddhism. It also very well developed by, by Plato in particular, his metaphor of the caves is, is driven in, you know, in a sense around um, liminality. And this is really because the importance is that if you just wait for things to pass or wait for something to be more clear, well, you're missing a trick because it may not. We then have what I, what I call um, an emergence from convergence where you had you know, machines or technology, which would converge, so different technologies converging and creating digital synergies. And that's what people called Industry 4.0 with smart machines. And what we're seeing now, cyber physical, is it cyber, is it physical, the clouds, cognitive computing, developments around artificial intelligence. The trend I'm, I, I think is, is accelerating and will be very pronounced in the 2020s is when you move from convergence to fusion. When you start having intelligence, maybe aware, maybe even social machines. When you're merging biological, physical, and digital, where there are digital and human synergies, no longer just digital synergies. What I labeled bio for digital, dot AI for the kicks. But ultimately, it's human intelligence with cognitive computing. Now, Ray Kurzweil, who, who enjoys these predictions around you know, singularity and when will machines be as intelligent or more as man, and, and who develops a number of these themes and you know, is well known for giving specific predictions in terms of um, what might happen and when, he considers that by the 2030s, humans will be more non-biological than biological. I actually think Ray Kurzweil might, might have a sense around that. What we're talking about here is is hyper-augmentation. Machines are learning fast. And of course, when you speak to Alexa or to Google Home and you look at what artificial intelligence can do, it's still pretty basic. But what's sure is that they're learning very fast. And so the question is, are we? I would like to maybe highlight what I define as hyper-augmentation. What I've tried to project is four columns where I'm looking at the value chain for decision making and to look at the role AI is having in this value chain. So we're starting on the left with what I've labeled optimization, which is automation, which is effectively doing things and tasks as we know them in a way that's more efficient or more automated. The second column is augmentation. So you have there, um, you have there, in augmentation, autonomous intelligence systems, which are starting to move, perceive, and learn. And I'm not necessarily talking about singularity or artificial general intelligence. I'm just talking about um, drones, which have sensors, which or cars, which have a better sense of what's next to them, what they should do, um, how to react. It's not perfect. I'm talking about radiology, um, where, you know, according to some recent studies, there are many things that are better detected um, than, uh, by AI than, um, 
than doctors. But doctors are still key. Everyone is still absolutely key. And what's happening is that they have a real augmentation role. In other words, there's the data, which is very bringing insights, which is helping with pattern recognition, which is, you know, you can train the algorithms, you have um, predictive analytics, and all this is, is really augmenting the role which humans have. And it's a, almost a sort of perfect um, relationship, very synergistic. Where it starts to encroach more is not to say that machines don't have value in doing so, but it, it's starting to feel maybe a little bit less comfortable than just augmentation or optimization is what I call creativity. So scientific research, that's obviously for a good cause, drug discovery, the huge role um, which we all know um, is being played there. Um, and it's a joint venture, but you're starting to see um, choreographies, for instance, where you have um, certain choreographies which are done main Wayne McGregor did the ballet basically with AI. You're starting to find um, a number of areas where um, there's creativity, drafting contracts, where there's lawyers being you know, substituted to a degree by, by AI. But the complex systems on the right is where the unknown unknowns, there are no right answers. And that is very difficult. You need more experimentation. Um, maybe AI is less good because the data is less, re less relevant in the sense that there isn't necessarily a right answer or known unknowns. You need the critical thinking and to see what's emergent. And so the question I have here is, is how close are we to, the, to that hyper augmentation and how reliant can we be on the fact that we are the best at um, um, processing and making decisions around what's complex and machines aren't. Now, just anecdotally, I picked up yesterday, um, you know, meet Erica, by the way, on the screen. She's an AI robot who's just been cast for a science fiction film um, called B. And I was speaking to Sigourney Weaver last night, as you can imagine, as the news broke out. And she was um, evidently very upset by this, because what does it mean for, for actors? Um, and so, yes, you have Japanese scientists who created Erica in real life as part of their study in robotics taught her to act, applying, you know, the principles and methods of acting. Um, and now it's effectively artificial intelligence, which has formally been cast in, in this movie. So this is um, one example amongst, amongst many. You have another uh, startup, interestingly, coming back to the, to the previous slide, with um, creativity and, and drafting contracts. Um, I saw that there's a startup with a Harvard graduate um, called Do Not Pay, which just got a, a Series A funding for, you know, valued at, uh, at 80 million with uh, Anderson and Horowitz and some of the other VCs investing, which is the world's first robot lawyer. And one might sort of think it's a little bit of a gimmick or just helping draft contracts. But here I'm talking about a startup which has already filed 1 million commercial claims to small courts. So this is, um, this is quite an interesting thing. And, you know, there's a positive virtue to that. If you can't afford a lawyer and you have a claim against a shop or an airline that didn't compensate you, it's a $3 or whatever subscription. So that's democratized. But there are a lot of people who are putting through those claims um, or some of those claims who, who may be um, substituted now. So as we move on from uh, Erica, say goodbye to Erica, we're going to look at um, what we call ambiguous complexity. And we, we were discussing earlier with the decision making and the value chain. We were discussing basically the complex area where, which is the unknown unknowns, there are no right answers, and you have to rely on emergent practices. It's only afterwards that you can retrospectively see the cause and effect. And here, this is different from complicated, where AI is very good, where AI is a strong comfort zone, because you can analyze the cause and effect, you can rely on experts because they are known unknowns, and there are a range of right answers. Why am I making this distinction? I'm making this distinction because for two reasons. I think, first of all, and this is, by the way, for those interested, is, is obviously Dave Snowden's his Kinevin framework, um, which, is a, which is a very important uh, way of analyzing domains and, and distinctions between uh, you know, what's chaotic, complex, or complicated. But the reason I've recently revisited this with, with fascination is because I think you're moving from a world which is complicated and sometimes complex to a world which is much more complex. And I'm not sure we're doing a fantastic job, COVID has shown, around decision making and, and leadership in complex. And if this is the predominant prevailing world, and we're not upgrading ourselves and making sure we can manage complex better, I think machines themselves will. So 
we're going to wrap up now um, and we're going to look at what, what all this means. What should we be aspiring for? I think when you see that uh, TikTok, the app, has beat all records in the first quarter and downloaded 315 million, um, yeah, basically over 300 million downloads. When you look at um, um, the triviality of a lot of this content with TikTok and that basically, apparently the top 50 content creators of TikTok have more followers than the entire populations of the UK, Canada, Mexico, and Australia combined. And when you think that ByteDance, for which, which owns um, TikTok and which is, uh, you know, the, most of the value of ByteDance is from TikTok, its crown jewel, is one of the most valuable unicorns in the world with a valuation reported to be about $140 billion. It makes you wonder whether we're on the right path to really um, master complexity and uh, disruption and, and thrive in the future world. And... Uh, when you look at what artificial intelligence and technology is doing, I don't think they're being necessarily as trivial as the content creation on TikTok. And so as we evolve, we need to think about what is our preferred future? What should we be aspiring for? I framed it in three ways. The first one, which is what I call fall off the edge of the playground, which is not the same from going to school and having a knowledge-based education system, which is rewarding students for repeating the right answers to known problems. I'm talking about the fact that children who are entering primary school will leave to jobs which don't even exist yet. So you need to really reframe education around inadequacies. You should almost be measuring failure as, a, as an achievement, not success. You should encourage imagination, challenge convention, instilling the comfort and ambiguity, uncertainty and complexity, making sure that we have no apologies when things go wrong, because what is wrong, what is right, if something is basically unpredictable, what is emerging, how does one adapt and navigate with comfort this ambiguity, this uncertainty and complexity. So schools should be a place where you experiment, where you iterate, where failure is accepted. That is how you learn. The world is changing at an exponential rate. And it's a place where we currently have short-term linear thinking. And that is probably one of the greatest threats to civilization. So we can't continue to be blind-sided and have a schooling system which is so ill-adapted to accelerating paradigm shifts and which, creating, which is basically creating leaders which can't lead. And so all this, it starts in the playground and through unlearning and relearning. My second aspiration is around the resetting. It's an existential moment for reimagining the world. But this reset really needs to be a catalyst to rebirth with a systems reload. We need the collective imagination to support and to let go of some of the legacy. We need to understand the social inequalities and climate and integrate that in our system reload. Innovation is needed more than it's ever been needed. We need to carefully manage the complexity and chaos we're living to reinvigorate the right innovation pathways in parallel. On the positive side, the chaotic times we've been living can sometimes be the best place to drive transformation. And so again, coming back to the concept of liminality, we should leverage on liminality for this transformation. We should thrive with the in-between liminal spaces of uncertainty to drive creative destruction and disruptive innovation. Now, these are two books and two concepts. They're not mine. On the left, you have Schumpeter's Creative Destruction, which puts a premium on countries that invest in innovation through constant reinvention. So it's a process of industrial mutation that continuously revolutionizes the economic structure, incessantly destroying the old, incessantly creating a new one. Or Clayton Christensen, who, who sadly passed away, um, the, who coined the term disruptive innovation and wrote many fascinating things around the uh, innovator's dilemma, but also the purpose and, uh, and fulfillment of life. Um, he refers to innovation that creates a new market eventually disrupting an existing market, displacing established market-leading firms and products. 
So there's an element of destruction, basically. But it's not enough to just destruct, and it's not enough to just rebuild. We need to reset and think about what we actually want to rebuild. And the final one is, is what I look at by contrasting the new equilibrium, which is where a system reaches a balance among competing forces that's significantly dis different from the current balance, where we see humans becoming more versatile to navigate and manage complexity and avoid being trampled by what Michelle Walker calls the gray rhino, which are predictable events that, pretend, that are, are portrayed as not being predictable. COVID was predictable to a degree, and a lot of the steps that have been taken were lack of anticipation. It is not a black swan. There's a fantastic book, again, Nicholas Taleb, who is also the author of Anti-Fragile, called Black Swans. There's also a fantastic book by Michelle Walker called The Gray Rhino. And we need to understand the distinction between gray rhinos and black swan. We need to understand what can be prepared for versus what is uh, apparently coming out of nowhere. And the humans, we need to become what I call triple A, which is anticipatory, anti-fragile, and have adaptive agility so that we can have the augmentation and the hyper-augmentation relationship with machines and not be substituted. The alternative is a transformation, and I'm not sure I'm keen on that transformation, which is where the current system is discarded in favor of a new one with a new set of rules. And those new rules could see, for instance, artificial intelligence on its way to artificial general, general intelligence dominating the strategic decision making. That is more of a dystopian view where not only machines continue to be intelligence, which is going to happen anyway, but which is where humanity still considers that TikTok is, is worthy um, of spending all our kids' time with, as opposed to the AAA. So I'll finish to wrap up, um, and I hope it didn't cut too much short the, the question time. <clears throat> but effectively, as we wrap up, we're in a transition between augmented decision making, and I think 43% of, of you guys agree, AI, which is very good making decisions in autonomous fields. Experts are, are pretty key and, and should be trusted, but data insights are also helpful. And we have a predictive world. And that for me is much better than the future, which is more dystopian, where we ignore the AAA. We don't bother to become anticipatory. We continue to be super fragile and not worry about adapting or being agile. And where maybe you go from C-suite for CEO, CFO, chief marketing officer, to A-suite, where basically your CEO is an algorithm where the world is so complex and we've been so careless at upgrading our skills that basically we have trouble navigating and, and thriving in this complexity and machines who continue to learn are doing a better job out of it. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot for that, uh, uh, Roger. Uh, very insightful and uh, lots of great insights there on the future trends that are shaping uh, uh, our collective futures. And one of the polls that I do want to launch on the back of this is thinking about where we can invest our time and seeing all the upheaval that's happened over the last six months. Um, you know, aside from the TikTok and the vanity applications, uh, which are the ones that uh, you think uh, in our audience we should be focusing more on? So there's a quick poll there. Should we be focusing on the planet? more social in, uh, equality, looking at the economy or their health and uh, well-being. So whilst you're kind of uh, uh, polling there, Rogers very kindly agreed to have a, um, a more intimate coffee lounge. So, uh, you know, after the top of the hour, we'll stop recording and uh, we can seep into a more informal discussion. You can let your uh, Zoom videos uh, uh, fly and just talk, uh, you know, more uh, more intimately. So please, for anybody who's still around uh, and has the time, uh, please join us for that. Uh, so let's see what the poll reveals. So 21 of you, 44% uh, believe that planet is the most important thing. Uh, and I've seen this, uh, uh, this, this meme where you've got three big waves and, you know, mm -hmm. the first one uh, is Brexit, and then the second one is COVID, and then the third one, uh, in terms of size of tsunami, is planet. It's climate change. So 
it's really interesting how just in six months, the whole world is turned upside down. Six months ago, we were looking in horror at uh, the, the, the wildfires in Australia. And I can't believe that it was literally at the end of December that this was all happening. And then COVID happened when we just started thinking, well, okay, that's going to be contained to Asia. It hasn't ever crossed international borders. Um, but, but now, after three months of lockdown, there's a complete uh, you know, change of society. And then we've got all the social. All of it is happening at the same time. And I guess the optimism is that we have some very uh, impressive technologies that we can use to uh, you know, solve these problems. Uh, and now there's a couple of questions uh, uh, I'd like to kind of take on behalf of the audience as they were asking. Uh, Julian, uh, uh, first of all, asked, you know, he agrees with your importance of exponential growth. Uh, you know, but how do you communicate this with management and what are the tips and ideas to communicate this effectively? Do you have any thoughts and suggestions for, for, for Justin there? Sure. So... When I talk about exponential, I'm not necessarily trying to, to just shop it as, as the, the way forward. I think there are two elements to it. One is to try and process what it means. And when you look at the next order implications of the trends we're seeing or some of the dynamics, is to actually understand that some of these might be exponential and what does that actually mean? And then indeed, there's a question of whether we use it as a tool and exponential growth and exponential thinking. <clears throat> but my advice for, for leadership teams, and I do a lot, of, a lot of work on this, is really to actually understand exponential in terms of how it's reshaping your industry, in terms of how it's reshaping things. Understand how to be anticipatory, what it is to be fragile versus, to use Taleb's terms, anti-fragile. And the concept of just plugging in exponential growth as a buzzword to scale, to have a platform and network effect. If you have an organization which is fragile, which is spending hundreds of billions or whatever on share buybacks and, you know, wasting precious resources on doing precisely what you need to do to be less fragile and to be more anticipatory, it then just becomes a buzzword. And so, you know, it's like everything, there's the, there's the um, carrot and the stick um, on exponential. Okay, thanks a lot for that. A question from Cedric. Um, how would you rate the importance of EQ versus IQ of the CEO? Um, and would the CEO not become more of a surveyor in chief to give direction rather than the controller in chief if that was an algorithm? Yeah. I mean, listen, e EQ is clearly extremely important. If you think about <clears throat> some of the things as humans, we, we currently have the edge over. There's, there's instinct, there's um, emotional side, there's hopefully our ability to navigate well you know, over time and complexity if we do what we need to do. But again, I would not make any assumptions on uh, the fact that uh, there's an exclusivity for emotional intelligence with the humans. There's a lot of technology and development in emotional intelligence. There's, in fact, a whole area of artificial intelligence called the emotional artificial intelligence. <clears throat> There's a startup called Affectiva, which basically can detect how people are feeling, replicate, um, adapt to the environment. There's some good uses for this, for children or people with um, certain um, impairments or other areas to be able to have things detected by the technology, which maybe their school teacher couldn't and more availability of time. And so there's some very positive uses, but yes, EQ is important and more and more important. But again, if uh, machines continue to learn and we don't upgrade ourselves, um, machines might even beat us at some point on the EQ side. Thank, thanks for that. Um, we'll take one more question. And then uh, given that we've uh, reached the top of the hour, uh, we'll switch the recording off and uh, literally just give you a chance to open up and ask freely. So um, last question here is from Charlotte. Uh, how can the roles of governance adapt if we experience exponential growth within industries that give rise to opportunities for good, but also manipulation? So governance in the paradox of, you know, being able to use, uh, uh, you know, these advancing technologies in, in the good, but also how do you police the bad? 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's the question, right? Um, it's exactly the, the debate which is happening um, with surveillance, which is the right debate where, you know, as we discussed earlier, Amazon, Microsoft um, have themselves decided without even any government intervention to, to put a pause on it until they have a better sense of how it's used and where it's going. Um, listen, everybody has a role in, in that. There's a, there's a lot of work being done. I think what's, um, what's, what's true, and I really encourage you to, to read and listen to uh, Yuval Harari on, on these topics, is that you know, I think he's right. He considers that basically there will be a kind of big inflection point around a lot of these themes, how technology is used as we rebuild. And uh, this is happening over the next few months. A lot of it will be happening now. Some of it will be legislation, guidelines, self-discipline. Um, and we all have a role to play in being very sensitive to what all this means. So, um, and, and we have to do that in a way where we don't ignore countries like China and what they're doing, because we also need to understand the ramifications of geopolitically and, and global um, AI dominance for, for one country versus another. So those debates are, are the right ones. I don't have a magic answer, um, but you have at one end of the spectrum, the European frameworks on the G, G, GDPR, um, or <laughs> I always get the acronym wrong, GDPR. but... Uh, <laughs> and on the other end of the spectrum, you have China. Um, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong, on the contrary, with what Europe is doing. But when others aren't playing the same game, technology is still advancing. And so what are the right frameworks which make sure you don't get um, behind on technology? Um, and then maybe there's more risk of it being wrongly used when you're not um, up to date on what, what can be done, either at a country level or at a company level. Fantastic. Um, that was uh, really interesting. And thank you, Roger, for uh, spending the time with us. It was uh, a very in-depth uh, session. I learned a lot from it.